revolution and now the industrial revo uh, scientific revolution, now the industrial revolution. It's one thing for that person to say, we need to become more like Europeans. We need to change. We need to learn these European methods. But it's quite another thing for some guy out in the farm to feel that way. How do you convince him? How do you convince him that he has to change his life, change the way he is, change the schools that his kids go to, change the clothes that they wear, change everything about their lives? Because that's what had to be done. In the end, there weren't any half measures. In the end, you had to be like a European to be as strong or as rich as a European. Uh, it's sad, it's unfortunate, but um, it is the way in which it worked. So the Ottomans, the Ottomans realized that they had to do something, especially because they were getting killed. One of the things I ask my students is, when I tell them about the history, which I tell them in a lot more than the two minutes that I will hear, when I tell them about the history of these Muslims who were kicked out of Greece and the Balkan Wars kicked out of here from Serbia and many other places, here in 1878 from Bulgaria, here in the 1850s from the Crimea, here in the 1860s from the area that the Russians took over in the Caucasus, here in the 1820s, here in the 1870s. When you look at all those people, the first ones are the ones that were killed, and the second ones are the ones that were thrown out of their countries. And I go to my students and I say, students, tell me, tell me, why haven't you heard about this before? And they go, well, maybe it didn't happen and you made it up. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really do that. But you can tell some of them are thinking that. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, we just have to come to grips with our own prejudice sometimes. And nobody cared about these people. It's just that simple. They died like flies and nobody noticed, except the Ottoman government, <coughs> which had to do something about it, which had to figure out a way to deal with that. About before the Balkan Wars, up to the time of the Balkan Wars in 1912, 1913, there were about two million Muslims that were killed and another two million that were exiled from their land. Uh, the Turks were pushed farther and farther and farther back, further and further and further, until finally they got to here, which today is pretty much what Turkey is, and there they had their backs to the wall. The next time that people took over things from the Turks, I firmly believe, if they'd succeeded, there wouldn't be any more Turks. Look again. In 1912, in 1912, the Ottoman Empire was left with the Arab world, this area down here, which they were about to lose, and with what today is modern Turkey. That was the area that was left. Unfortunately for them, they lost. They held out amazingly. I mean, the Ottoman Empire managed to fight off France and Britain and Russia and hold on one way or the other for three years in a First World War. It's astonishing that they could do that. But in the end, the fact that they didn't even have shoes for many of their troops turned out to be something of a disability. The fact that they couldn't possibly have either enough men. I mean, the British, for instance, the British brought from India alone, the British brought three times as many soldiers as were in the entire Ottoman army, right? Three times as many, that's just the Indian soldiers. So the Ottomans lost. They lost, and when they lost, they could look forward to a tremendous destruction of everything that they could hold. During the war, Russians held this territory. Immediately after the war, most of it went to the new Armenian Republic. The French occupied the territory down in here. And Greeks occupied this territory here. Now you might say, what do I mean by occupied? What I mean is at the Paris Peace Conference, the Versailles Peace Conference at the end of World War I, you had people who had promised in the armistice at Mudros that took the Ottomans out of the war, that promised that they would only invade Ottoman territory in, in Anatolia, in this region. They would only invade if there was some sort of disruption, especially if Christians were armed. Well, of course, there weren't any disruptions. As a matter of fact, all the European consuls who were there at the time, this is like the end of 1918, 1919, all, that, all they say is there was no problem. But 
Lloyd George and other politicians wanted the Greeks to come into this territory, wanted the Armenians to have this territory, so they simply made it up. They simply lied. And they lied to the press, they lied to everybody else, and if any newspaper in Britain dared to write, you know, they dared to write, no, no, this is, we're here, this is happening. If they dared to do that, they would find that they were completely censored and weren't allowed to print it. It wasn't until Arnold Toynbee published a book on the subject that people began to say, hey, wait a minute, in Europe. But the Turks knew right from the beginning, because from the first day of the occupation, the first day of the occupation, the Turks were being killed in large numbers. The first day. But what happened was, this kind of monstrous attack on the people, this kind of frustration that they could had nowhere to go, this kind of back to the wall feeling ended up mobilizing the Turks. But having all these Turks all around the country, having them all be people that were forming their own little groups, their own little defense groups in their village, in their town, what good would that have done against an army? What was needed was a leader. And luckily for the Turks, they came up with one. A general in the Ottoman army named Mustafa Kemal. Mustafa Kemal was perhaps the only authentic war hero to come out of World War I with pretty much nothing but victories. He had been the man who was most prominent at Gallipoli. He had fought against the Russians and defeated them in battles around Bitlis in the southeast of Anatolia. He had, even though the armies of the Turks were defeated by the English, overwhelmed by the English still, he had kept his army together and brought it up into Anatolia where it was still intact, which was going to end up being very important. Mustafa Kemal, unfortunately, there's never enough time to talk about Mustafa Kemal, one of the greatest men who's ever been. Mustafa Kemal organized the Turks, brought them together, and taught them, you know, how to work as a unit. And I mean, when I say taught them, they were military men, they already knew. But we're talking about villagers. We're talking about bandits. We're talking about every kind of person you can imagine, all brought together, including the women all over Anatolia, who both fought and were the ammunition carriers. And there are all these pictures, the great pictures that I don't have time to show you, of women working in the ammunition factories. I mean, everybody's brought together with tremendous success. But at the end, now, just a couple more pictures of Mustafa Kemal. A couple more. A couple extra pounds? Yeah. All right. <laughs> because I just want you to see what kind of guy this was like. Now, you figure, he himself was a person of, uh, uh, say, let's say, lack of religion, would be proper to say. He was not a very religious sort of person. But the picture down here, the picture down here shows him praying. This is the way Muslims pray, right? It shows him praying, and it shows him praying at the first session of the new parliament, which is set up in Ankara. And it shows this man is a Muslim religious leader, and there are all kinds of people there with him. This shows him with a whole bunch of local and uh, Anatolian people, both army and regular people, at one of the con congresses that set up the republic. This shows him with generals and others, civilians, and this is a very famous picture of a very famous picture of him from the Independence War. But this up here, I think, is interesting. Look at the different kinds of people. You have an old, you have an old religious leader. You have a, a more orthodox, regular religious leader. You have a guy that somehow believes he should be wearing a light brown coat. <laughs> you have all these people gathered together. He brought them all together. He was an astonishing man. He managed to do that. But when it was all done. When it was all done, what was left in Anatolia, what was left in Anatolia was, is that the same one? Get it again. Yeah, okay, good. Yes. What was left in Anatolia was just the worst kind of destruction you can imagine. Right? Just to give you a feeling, just to give you a feeling, this is the place, you're not misreading this. This province, for instance, 62% of the population is gone at the end of the wars. Almost two-thirds of the people are dead. Compared to that, other things don't look so bad, right? You go over here and you say, oh, this is only 40% of the population dead. There has never been, never been a war in America, and almost never in Europe, 
that can match the kind of death we're seeing here.